Church, uh, which we do on the first Sunday of each month here at Bethel. So um, last year, life was really full for me, and I was doing a whole bunch of, of things. There was work, and then there was side work to have extra money to pay off some debts that I had, and there was life, and there was kids, and there was a whole bunch of things going on, and I made this decision to stop going to the gym that I had been going to for about three years. And uh, after three years of going to the gym, I was confident I knew what I needed to do to stay fit and be healthy and work out. In fact, I have all of the equipment. Everything you could possibly want, aside from some like maybe some rowing machines or a bike. But I thought going into the summer, I'll just run and I'll work out by myself because now I know what to do. And uh, it wasn't long after telling my coaches that I wouldn't be coming back to the gym that I realized I don't work out by myself because it's stupid and it's tiring and exhausting and there's really no way to like encourage yourself in the midst of it. That, I found this out about myself. It was an eye-opening experience and I just thought, that's fine. I won't lose that much muscle mass. I'll, I'll stay pretty fit. Maybe I'll skip rope every now and then and I'll go on a run and I'll just be, I'll be good. And uh, for seven months, I didn't go to the gym. And during those seven months, I worked out twice. I was used to working out at the gym three or four times a week, and then I also had all of my equipment at home, and I was doing additional strength training at home, so I was actually getting in like seven or eight workouts in a week, and I went down to two in seven months by not going to the gym. And what's interesting is those two times that I did work out, I worked out because I, I'm, I'm in love with the sport of CrossFit, and there was semifinals, and so I watched people do CrossFit in competition, and I was like, I wanna do that, and I like grabbed a barbell and I did one 20 minute workout, and then a few months later, this thing called the CrossFit Games happens, which is this big competition, it's the, it's the year-end competition for CrossFit, and again, I saw those workouts got a little bit competitive, and did a workout that day. But other than that, there was no physical activity. I did one run, and I'm getting old, and my knees hurt for like three days, and I like, I just whined like a baby after running six kilometers, and my wife's like, stop. Just don't even run, it's not even worth it at this point. Just, just roll over. Um, and so, so, it was this really interesting thing. As I think back, during that time, I broke my hand because I realized that the gym was also a great way to like, get out some physical, uh, maybe frustrations. I became a lot less productive uh, in the areas. My relationships got a little bit more tense. I was a little uh, more agitated, a little bit quicker to be frustrated with my kids or with my spouse or with uh, folks here at the church, um, where I just kind of removed myself because I was like, if I deal with this, I'm actually just gonna be, it's gonna be bad. And during these seven months, it was this like really crazy spiral of realizing the importance of the community aspect of the gym. And that this community helped me continue in consistency. And I was very confident that because of the consistency I had developed over three years, that I would be able to hold that for a few months, maybe save some money, pay off some debt, and once I was debt free, I would jump back into the gym. That was my mentality. So just go hard, making some money, doing some jobs, quit paying this membership fee, and then one day you'll be able to pay it again. And it was just like month after month, or week after week, month after month, that I started to go, I don't think this is working the way I expected it to. I need to be around people to suffer together, but also <laughs> to celebrate together. Because when you go to a gym where you're told what to do for an hour, and you have 12 other people that are doing the exact same thing as you, and you like you do a burpee and you look up, and like everyone has that dazed look in their eyes, we're like, what are we doing with our lives? You're like, yeah, but we can do another burpee. <laughs> and it's a moment to just encourage us to continue. And it was really interesting that the two times, as I think back to it, when I did work out, were when these large global events happened that caused me to feel this I should work out. And it almost became a guilt point for me that I needed to work out. And as I think about this story and the church, and I think about the way that we come together in community, 
typically once a week, and sometimes throughout the weeks, that we sometimes fall into these patterns where we go, I think I know enough that I can do this by myself. And we begin to kind of walk away from the fervency of the community. There are times where I go to the gym where I tell you my 100% is about 20% of yesterday's effort, but it's what I have that day. And there's times in my faith where my 100% is less than what it was yesterday. But there is, there is a sense that we have where sometimes we begin to walk away from community in faith and we go back or we think about community in faith when big events happen, Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, a wedding, a funeral. And these moments remind us, oh yeah, and you feel a little bit of guilt. I better read. You get sick and you just go straight to the book of Revelations because the world is ending every time you're sick. And it's like there's these moments that just kind of like try to remind us of this deep community and this sense and need for community. But we weren't meant to just go from moment, from big moment to big moment. Our life of faith is called to walk through both the mountaintops and the valleys. The God of the mountaintop, the God of those big moments, is the same God of the valleys that we walk through. And so this morning, I want to begin to speak about community being key, and we're going to look in the book of Acts chapter 2. I know James spoke on it last week, but I want to just highlight this as we look through the beginnings of the church, um, the bride of Christ expanding. This is after the death and resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the apostles. And as we'll see through the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit continues to pour out and fill those who would call upon the name of Jesus. In verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, it says, They, those being the disbelievers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together and with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily. This is found in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. And it speaks of a really beautiful, faith-filled community. Community is a special thing because when we are surrounded by community, it brings us through, we win together and we lose together when you're in community. There are moments at the community of the gym where I don't want to be there, but somebody else, their gusto for lifting weights that day draws me to just kind of fall into place alongside them. We journey together in it. The same is true at the church. Sometimes we come to this place with a lot of weight on our shoulders, don't we? Or we've had a rough week. Maybe we didn't sleep. Maybe we heard some news. Maybe we got some phone calls that we just didn't want to deal with this week. And we bring it. And it weighs us down because we, we bear these weights that we're not supposed to carry. Or that we are to bring before the Lord. And we come into this place of community, this place of fellowship, this place where we rub elbow to elbow with people who journey alongside us in this life. And all of a sudden, the weights we carry, we can begin to share, and they encourage us to lay it down at the feet of Jesus. One of the things we want to do here deeply at Bethel, written here on the side, is to encourage people to follow after Jesus in all aspects of their life. You do that through community. Community brings people from guests to friends and friends to family. When my wife and I showed up at this church uh, five years ago, or ish, four and a half years ago, we had family members here, but there was a number of people that were brand new to us that now we consider to be family. And it's very special because community allows us to grow together, to build trust and build relationships with one another. Community is having common unity in something, isn't it? And when we come to church, we have a common unity in the person of Jesus. When we go, hey, I'm going to the park with my kids, you want to come with me? 
It's like we have a touch point at church and now we go to the park and we get to just be out in our greater community as part of this small community of believers at the park with our kids, watching our kids run and play. Community is this key element that enables us to persevere in our faith because sometimes it feels very hard to walk that journey alone. And I want to tell you something, you actually aren't supposed to walk the journey of faith alone. I want to introduce you to a verse in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God says, Let us, this is a big word, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they might rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock and the wild animals and the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. He blessed them and he said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And then this is what God says in verse 31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Genesis 1, 26 through 31. God speaks this word. He says, let us make man in our image. This speaks of the Trinity. In the Christian faith, we believe it, we, we are a monotheistic faith. We believe in one God represented in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. For the simplest methodology that I have in understanding what that means is an egg. You have the eggshell, the egg yolk, and the egg white. And all of these make up the egg, and together they are the egg. And if you looked at an eggshell, you'd say, that's an egg. And if you looked at the egg whites, you'd be like, that's an egg. And if you looked at the yolk, you'd say, that's an egg. And so it is with God. That we have God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, separate entities, same being. And hopefully that's not utterly confusing, but that's about as much time as we're going to spend on that in this present moment. And God looks at, he says, let us collective, create them in our collective image and likeness. And this is so neat, church. This means that God in himself, at the center of the universe, is founded in community. His very being is communal. We see through it all of scripture that Jesus interacts with the Father, and the Father interacts with the Son, and the Holy Spirit interacts with both of them. And what we see is there's this, uh, there's this serving in community, found in the Trinity. You were created by community for the purpose of community in Genesis 1. And we try to think sometimes that we are better than God and we can do it by ourselves and we can do it alone. But the reality is, is that God, from the very onset, designed you to be in community. In fact, in Genesis 2, he, we see that there is even a, a deeper, like a zoomed-in expansion on this story, right? You like read it big, and then you zoom in and you're like, oh, there's another layer here. And in Genesis 2... Uh, God is speaking about how he created Adam out of the dust, and it's, he says, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a suitable helper for him. And what we see is even in this moment, in all of the things that God created, the only thing that he declares to not be good is for man to not be in community. He says, this alone is not okay. So let us build community. I look at this church here this morning, and there are people, every person here has the opportunity to build faith-filled community in your context, in your church, in your community, be it your workplace, be it at the local gym. We will lift weights together and do burpees of death and question our life's decisions, but we will love it because we are in community together. Each one holds an opportunity to develop community. It's not my job to plan your social calendar. I'm sorry if that's your hope. We will give you great opportunity to have awesome moments of meeting people like at Alpha. Can I just take a moment to brag on Alpha? We have folks ranging from the ages of 23 to 76 in Alpha. 
We have an array of backgrounds, an array of life experiences, an array of expectations, an array of people who are like, I've never looked at a Bible in my life to people who are like, I have followed the Lord for 46 years or more. This is a group of individuals that has zero reason to know each other. And yet for eight weeks and now an entire 48-hour weekend, we have spent time together in community. That church is incredible, and we will build and we will offer opportunities like that. But church, I want you to know that you have an opportunity, a res I would even say a responsibility, that's a big R word, to develop community in the context. You'll have a sandwich with someone. Hey, we're going to the park. You want to come to the park? Kids always love going to the park with other friends, and then mom and dad get a break. It's great. You're in community, your kids are busy, and you're like, this is so lovely. Community allows us to win together and to lose together, as I said. Community allows us to come alongside one another. You were built by community, you were built for community, so enter into community. We celebrate together, we mourn together, we grow together, we develop together. In Romans chapter 12, verse 15, it says, mourn with those who mourn and celebrate with those who celebrate. Do you know what that means, friends? I need to know what's going on in your life and you need to go know what's going on in my life so that on the things I'm mourning, you can mourn with me on. And the things that you're joyous about, I can be joyous with you on. Let me celebrate those things with you and let it, you celebrate those things with one another. Mourning together, celebrating together, winning together, losing together. This is a team sport. We might be individuals, but we work as a group, we work as a community, we work as a team. We grow together, we develop together. In church, we're not just looking to build a fan club. We're not just looking to build a social gathering. The aspect of church is a faith-filled, authentic community who's pursuing Jesus. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes that the community is for the maturing of believers and the bringing on of those who are new to the faith. I think that's a beautiful image of, of what the church can look like. That it's not just a social club we come to on Sundays. It's not just a book club that we do on Sunday mornings. This is an, an opportunity to journey with one another. To meet people you would likely not meet many other places. And then to get to walk shoulder to shoulder with them. Finding someone who becomes a friend. Finding someone who becomes a lifelong friend. Finding someone that would travel with you to Roatan and hang out on a vacation with you. If you're up, let me know, because I want to go to Roatan again. <laughs> Community is this opportunity where we get to grow in relationship with one another. In 1 Corinthians, Chapter 13, I'm going to turn there. Nope, not there, that's the book of John. Do, 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 do. Timothy, Ephesians, Galatians, Acts. It's in here, I promise you. First Corinthians 1, 7, 9, 12, 13. Here we go. Okay, First Corinthians 13, I folded the page and then I forgot I folded it. Um, we are going to look at this verse found in First Corinthians 13. If you've been to a wedding in a church setting, you've probably heard this. Paul speaks, he says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but not of love, I'm a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal or a child with a recorder at bedtime. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and I have all knowledge and I have all faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I am nothing. And if I give all that I have uh, to the poor, and if I give my body to hardship, that I might boast in the work that I've done, but I have not love, I have gained nothing. Paul, in this moment, speaks so deeply of what it looks like to live in an authentic, faith-filled community. At the very heart of it is love. When, we, when you meet somebody and the first thing they say about you is extremely critical, it's hard to build a relationship, isn't it? Right? But when we meet people and in community we grow in relationship and trust, and then those critical things come, we see the heart behind it of like, oh, you're just actually making me better. 
Like when I go to the gym and my coach is like, hey Matt, can I, can I just speak on something here? Your form is awful and you're gonna break your back, so you should stop. I'm like, oh. You're not being rude to me because I haven't built in trust that what you're doing is for my benefit. And this is the value that Paul speaks about in 1 Corinthians 13, is that how we deal in community with love actually enables us to have incredible access to come alongside people in their journey of faith. In a way that enables us to be able to be in correction with one another. But we need to come to this point of communal, community and trust in this development of relationships so that we know that people care and we can say this, I trust that you care about me, therefore I will listen to this rebuke, this correction, this advision, whatever it may be. Community has group accountability in it. And sometimes when we know we've done something wrong, we really want to avoid community, don't we? Because we're like, I just don't want to be shamed. I don't want to be judged. I don't want to be made to feel worse than I already do. But friends, authentic faith-filled community welcomes, accepts, forgives. It doesn't always affirm sin. It shouldn't affirm sin. We shouldn't be affirming. But we should always be accepting, loving, grace-filled, and willing to come alongside people. So their response to, I've been to church, that place just made me feel shame. Oh, it hurts when I hear that on people's lips. I'm like, I am so sorry for that experience. Church, you have a responsibility to demonstrate what authentic faith-filled community looks like. We have group accountability here. There are people in this church that I know in a moment of desperation and panic, I can call and in a heartbeat would answer the phone and would pray for me. And I need that in my life. And you need that in your life. Authentic faith-filled community purposes us for the maturing of our faith and the relationships with one another, our relationship with God, and then our ability to care for our greater community that exists outside of these four walls we come and hunker in on a Sunday morning. This is a place of sending. This is a place of huddle and a place of going out after the, the break, if you like football. This is a place of coming, of being refreshed, of being challenged, encouraged, and then going and living an authentic community in the greater community of Nelson. Doing so with love, so that we're not a resounding gong to our community, so that we're not a clanging and clashing symbol, and we're not as annoying as that recorder being learned by a seven-year-old. I've heard that. And if you allow it, it actually gets better over time as they get skilled and they love it. Love is this ingredient that God has deposited in the middle of community that allows us to be able to see his uh, church matured and purposed and commissioned to go forward. So friend, I want to encourage you in, in this community today. You were built by community for the purpose of community. Now, does that mean that every single person in the church has to come over to your house at some point for a dinner? Probably not. It's probably not going to happen. We're a growing church, and that would be a lot of dinners. Um, if you want to, you can certainly invite everybody. Go for it. I'm not going to stop you from doing that. But find some spaces of community within this church. And then watch and see how they grow. We don't want to be a clicky place. Like, I only hang out with these people, and you hang out with those people. Sometimes for extroverts, we want to hang out with all the people, and for introverts, we want to hang out with none of the people. There's probably a balance in the middle where we find spaces of community within this community, where people are welcomed, where people are encouraged, where people are grown, where we can win together, where we can celebrate the things that God has done, and we can encourage people in the things that God is going to be doing. Encouraging people and pointing them to Jesus as we progress the community. Over the next few weeks, we're going to continue to look through the books of Acts, the book of Acts, which should appropriately be titled The Acts of the Holy Spirit Through the Apostles and the Disciples into their community. 
And over it, we're going to be looking at how the Holy Spirit wants to move through our lives into the lives of the community of Nelson and into the lives of the communities of those beyond Nelson and into the Kootenays and so on and so forth because I deeply, I deeply, deeply, deeply believe that when we walk in an authentic faith-filled community that understands who our creator is and understand that our purpose is to go and make disciples, that we will see an incredible move of God in our midst. Not because we're doing it, but because he's doing it through us. So church, I want to challenge you in community today. It can be tough. It can be messy to walk shoulder to shoulder with people. You get to find out things about people that you wish you didn't know. But as people share that with you, it, it is our opportunity to demonstrate and speak with love. It's our opportunity to speak with forgiveness, to speak with grace, to speak with biblical correction, and to speak with encouragement towards Jesus. And so church, I want to bless you this morning, and then we're going to uh, celebrate a time of communion together. And I'll explain that after I, after I speak this blessing. So Father God, I just bless those who are here today. I thank you for their place and their purpose in community. I thank you that none of us are here by mistake this morning, God. And that, God, that you build community because you have demonstrated perfect community to us. God, I pray for each one that as we would look to you, Jesus, we would be in deeper community with you. And as we look to those around us, that, God, there would be developed relationships here that would be for the maturing of believers, the bringing in of new individuals, and the unity of the church overall. We thank you, God, that your heart is for common unity amongst us. And, God, we ask that you would bring your spirit to demonstrate that to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Get you to turn off the... So here at Bethel, we do communion once a month on the first Sunday of the month. 